The way to get the vast majority of cards into play where they can actually do something is by casting them. However, there are a few cards that, for whatever reason, see heavy play but are almost never cast. Starting off at number 10, we have Archon of Cruelty. This 6-6 Archon has a mana cost of 6 and 2 black, flying, meaning it can only be blocked by flying creatures, and the ability where if it enters a battlefield or attacks, your opponent sacrifices a creature or a planeswalker, discards a card, and loses 3 life. And then you draw a card and gain 3 life yourself. This is obviously a huge amount of value, and worth the steep 8 mana cost in order to cast Archon. However, Archon is only legal in eternal formats like Modern, and decks in that format can usually win the game by turn 4, or even turn 3 in some situations. As a result, Archon of Cruelty mostly sees play as part of reanimator decks in Modern and Legacy, and therefore qualifies for this list because people aren't casting Archon. In Modern, these decks use Faithful Mending, which allows you to draw two cards and then discard two cards and Unmarked Grave, which lets you search your deck for a non-legendary creature and put it directly into your graveyard, and then use cards like Persist and Priest of Fell Rites, cards that let you put a creature card from your graveyard directly into the battlefield, to cheat creatures into play far earlier than you could normally cast them. In Legacy, reanimator decks have even better ways to do all these things, like Faithless Looting and Entomb, which are basically just cheaper versions of Faithful Mending and Unmarked Grave and Reanimate, a cheaper version of Resist with negligible downsides of needing to pay life. And Archon of Cruelty is one of the best creatures to cheat out, at least one of the best non-legendary ones. This is pretty important, at least in Modern, where the best reanimation spell is Persist, which can only target non-legendary creatures. One of the things that's so good about Archon of Cruelty is that it gets so much card advantage as soon as it comes down, being able to get a 4 for 1 if you count the removal spell your opponent needs to kill it. This is really important because you usually have to use multiple cards in order to get Archon out in the first place, so recouping the card advantage is important. So Archon finds its way onto this list for being the best non-legendary threat to cheat into play with reanimation spells, though we will be going over the legendary options later on in this list. In at number 9, we have Progenitus. This is a 10-10 legendary Hydra avatar with a ludicrous mana cost of 2 of each of the 5 colors of mana, and has protection from everything, meaning it can't be targeted, blocked, dealt damage, or have anything attached to it. And it also has an ability where if it would be put into your graveyard, you instead reveal it and shuffle it into your library. This card's mana cost is far too expensive and difficult to pay for to ever really be cast anywhere and its effects to shuffle it into your library make it so that reanimation spells won't work on it, because it can't be put into your graveyard. So, how do you put Progenitus into play? Well, by far the most common way to put this card out is using Natural Order and Legacy Elves. Natural Order is an incredibly strong sorcery that allows you to pay 4 mana and sacrifice a green creature to search your library for a green creature and put it directly into play. Legacy Elves is a deck that excels in putting out a ton of creatures and making a ton of mana very quickly. The general game plan is to use Glimpse of Nature, an incredibly strong source that lets you draw a card each time you cast a creature for just one mana. With cards like Heritage Druid, which lets you tap untapped elves for mana, this means you can get all of your mana and cards back from the elves you're playing, letting you play an atrocious number of creatures in one turn. Once you have a huge board, you would use Caterhoof Behemoth, which gives all of your creatures plus one plus one for each creature you have when it enters the field, or Allosaurus Shepherd which turns all of your elves into 5-5s with its active ability to pump your entire board and kill your opponent. The only problem is that elves are usually very small and fragile creatures, and your entire board can easily be killed with just one card. So what elves decks do is, instead of finding Caterhooth Behemoth off of their natural order on their combo turn, is simply go into Progenitus as soon as possible. Now, there are a few ways to kill a resolved Progenitus, such as forcing them to sacrifice it, or using non-targeting creature destruction, but these cards see a lot less play than simple targeted removal. So Progenitus remains one of the elves' best answers to one of their biggest weakness, namely cheap board wipes. And at number 8 we have Narcomoeba. This is a 1-1 flying illusion with a mana cost of 1 and a blue, and the ability whenever you mill it, you can put it directly onto the battlefield from your graveyard. There are a few cards that all do similar things Narcomoeba, namely coming back from your graveyard easily. Narcomoeba gets on this list over them not because it's more powerful, but because it's easier to use. It's really easy to mill a huge number of cards extremely quickly in Magic. One of the best ways to mill a lot of cards quickly is actually Dredge. What Dredge does is whenever you draw a card, if you have a card with Dredge in your graveyard, you instead mill a number of cards equal to its Dredge number, which in the case of Golgari Grave Troll would be 6, and return that card to your hand. With cards that allow you to draw just a few cards, 
you can mill around 15 cards for just a couple of mana. Once you've done that, you'll more likely than not have gotten a couple of free Narco Amoebas out of the deal. Now, Narco Amoeba isn't very impactful on its own, but players have found a ton of ways to make it far, far stronger than it normally would be. One way to do so is using Prize Amalgam, a 3-3 which returns itself from the graveyard to the field whenever a creature is returned from the graveyard to the field or cast from the graveyard. A Narco Amoeba does technically go from the graveyard to the field. This specific interaction is a big part of Dredge in Modern. Another way you can use Narco Amoeba is to sacrifice it for value. The best card for this is Dread Return, a sorcery that reanimates a creature in your graveyard and can be cast from your graveyard by sacrificing three creatures. A ton of decks use Dread Return and Narco Amoeba to set up combo plays in Legacy, though Dread Return is actually banned in Modern to prevent this combo. All in all, Narco Amoeba is one of the easiest ways to get a creature on the battlefield in all of Magic. And at number 7, we have Street Wraith. This card is a 3-4 Wraith with a mana cost of 3 and 2 black, Swamp Walk, meaning it can't be blocked if your opponent has a Swamp, and Cycling, pay 2 life, meaning you can pay 2 life to discard it and then draw another card. Street Wraith is pretty bad deal for 5 mana, which is why no one ever casts it. The main attraction on this card is obviously the cycling ability, as getting to draw a card for 0 mana is pretty nice. Of course, the 2 life is a small but real cost, so decks don't really play Street Wraith unless they can find some way to sweeten the pot a little. There are two main decks where players have found ways to make great effect of Street Wraith, Death's Shadow and Living End. First off, Death's Shadows is a 13-13 for a single black mana, but it gets negative XX where X is equal to your life total. So if you get your total life low enough, you can get a huge creature for just a single mana. Street Wraith goes great with this strategy, being able to lower your life total without using any mana or losing any card advantage, leading to being a mainstay in Death Shadows deck. On the other hand, we have Living End. This is a sorcery with no mana costs, meaning you can't cast it normally, but it does have a suspend 3 for 2 and 2 black mana, meaning you have to pay the mana cost and exile it with 3 time counters on it, and then during each of your upkeeps you remove a time counter, and you can cast it when the last of them is removed. Living End has the ability to essentially swap all the creatures in the field with all creatures in the graveyard, though due to the exact way it does this, it can actually get around hate cards like Graph Digger's Cage, because the creatures technically enter from exile rather than from the graveyard. Now, Living End is normally too slow for formats like Modern, but there are ways to cheat it out more quickly. The best way is with Cascade. Cascade is a keyword where, when you cast a spell with Cascade, you exile cards from the top of your library until you hit a non-land card whose mana value is less than the card you cast. And then you can cast that card for free and throw the rest of the cards on the bottom of your deck. What Living End decks do is simply not run any cards with the mana value of 1 or 2, so that whenever they cast their Cascade cards, the only spell they can hit is Living End. Of course, if you do that, then you won't have any creatures in your graveyard to cast. So what the deck does is play a bunch of big creatures with cycling or similar effects, which won't be cast off of your Cascade, but will put themselves into the graveyard with their abilities. And this is where Street Wraith comes in. As a creature that can cycle itself for 0 mana, it essentially gives the deck more damage and makes it more consistent by letting them draw through their deck easier, all for just 2 life. Street Wraith has seen play in a few other decks throughout the years, but Death's Shadow and Living End are definitely the most common. And at number 6, we have Cauldra Complete. This is a 7 mana legendary artifact equipment with indestructible and living weapon, which means when it enters the battlefield, you can make a 0 0 black germ creature token and attach Cauldra to it, and it gives the equipped creature plus 5 plus 5, haste, first strike, trample, indestructible, and gives the equipped creature the ability where whenever the creature deals combat damage to a creature, you exile that creature, and it has an equip of 7. So Cauldra is basically a 7 mana 5-5 five five with all of those abilities, that can also buff up another one of your creatures if you lose the germ token and have 7 mana to spend. Non-creature permanents are typically more difficult to cheat out than creatures, as you don't have the ability to reanimate them. However, due to equipment being kind of a weak card type, they get some really good support cards specifically Stoneforge Mystic. This is a 1-2 core artificer with a mana cost of 1 and 1 white, and when it enters the battlefield, you find any equipment in your library, reveal it, and put it into your hand. And most importantly, you can pay 1 and 1 white and tap Mystic to put in equipment from your hand directly onto the battlefield. This means that Stoneforge Mystic can cheat out the ridiculously powerful Cadra Complete as early as turn 3. What makes this interaction so good is the versatility of Stoneforge Mystic. There are quite a few good equipments you can find for Zerd matchups, so being able to find whatever you need for the situation is incredibly powerful. 
should really quickly mention Stoneforge's longtime partner, Batterskull. Batterskull is a 5 mana equipment that also has Living Weapon, gives equipped creature plus 4 plus 4, Vigilance, and Lifelink, and has the ability to bounce itself to your hand for 3 mana, and equip a 5. Before Cauldra Complete was released, Batterskull was the biggest and baddest equipment that Stoneforge Mystic could cheat out. Batterskull still sees some play alongside Cauldra Complete, as sometimes the life gain and ability to bounce itself back to your hand is better than the immediate damage from Cauldra. But Cauldra is seeing slightly more play than Batterskull, so it took precedent on this list. And at number 5, we have Leyline of the Void. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 2 and 2 black, and it has the abilities where if it's in your opening hand, you can start the game with it on the field. And if a card would be put into your opponent's graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. Graveyard decks have always been really strong, so cards like Leyline of the Void have always seen play to help keep them in check. This card is one of the best versions of these effects out there, as it's the only way to have this effect active during your opponent's first turn while you're going second. Now, actually casting Leyline of the Void for a full 4 mana is quite bad, so people generally just don't bother with it if they don't get it in their opening hand, and will usually mulligan for it if they really, really need it for a specific matchup. It also has one of the best versions of Graveyard Hate, as it stops cards from hitting the graveyard at all. You see, Leyline of the Void's second ability is what's called a replacement effect, so the cards that it exiles never actually hit the graveyard at all. This means that cards that care about when creatures die, like Blood Artists, won't trigger, because the card never went to the graveyard. Now, cards that care about when cards are discarded will still work with an opposing Leyline of the Void on the field because the cards are still being discarded, they just end up in exile instead of going to the graveyard. Leyline of the Void is also one of the best pieces of graveyard hate for decks that care about their own graveyard, as its effect is entirely one-sided. If you're trying to reanimate your creatures, having laid on the field won't impede you at all. When you put all these upsides together on top of the fact that you don't even need to pay mana for Leyline of the Void, you get one of the most heavily played sideboard cards in the game. And at number 4, we have Elvish Spirit Guide. This is a 2-2 Elf Spirit with a mana cost of 2 and green, and the ability where you can exile it from your hand to add 1 green mana. Being able to get more mana than you're supposed to have is always a good effect and being able to get mana without paying any mana is even better. Elvish Spirit Guide and her counterpart, Simeon Spirit Guide, have both mostly seen play in combo decks that just want to get their combos out as soon as possible. Simeon Spirit Guide sees play in Sneak and Show, a deck that tries to use Sneak Attack and Show and Tell to cheat out huge threats as quickly as possible, and sees play over Elvish Spirit Guide, mostly due to making red instead of green mana, which makes it better at helping you cast Sneak Attack. Sneak and Show can usually win if it's able to cheat out one of its threats into play, but the longer they have to wait to do so, the more likely their opponent can stop them with discard spells, a counter spell, or some sort of stacks piece. So, in order to try and get their threats out before their opponent can stop them, the deck uses fast mana cards that lose them card advantage to play their combo pieces earlier. Both cards also see play in Oops All Spells, a legacy combo deck that has to run no lands for its combo to work. Basically, how the combo works is they need to use Balistrad Spy to mill their entire deck. When Balistrad Spy enters the battlefield, it mills target player until they mill a land. So if you run no lands, you just mill your entire deck. Once you mill your whole deck, all your Necromibas will trigger themselves in the graveyard to return to the battlefield. Then you can sacrifice your Necromibas to cast Dread Return for its flashback cost and bring back Lothith Giant to burn your opponent for a ton of damage. Or bring back Thassa's Oracle, who enters the battlefield trigger will win you the game if your deck has no cards in it. Oops All Spells is a pretty strong combo deck, but it is weak to interaction like Force of Will. The main reason why other decks don't run these cards is because they lose you card advantage when you use them. However, decks like Sneak and Show and Oops All Spells will win if they get their combo off, regardless of how many cards they have left, so losing the card advantage isn't a big deal. Both of the Spirit Guides, as they're almost the same card, are both really strong and enable a ton of degenerate combo decks, to such a degree that Simeon Spirit Guide got banned from Modern though Elvish Spear Guide was never legal in that format to begin with. And at number 3, we have Omniscience. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 7 and 3 blue, and the ability where you can cast spells from your hand without paying mana for them. This is obviously a really strong effect, but it's usually kind of a win more card. After all, if you can manage to get Omniscience out to be able to cast a bunch of big, scary cards for free, surely you can just cast that card itself, right? While this is usually true, there are a few situations where it is worth it. For one, it's actually kind of nice in Commander, a format where you kind of need to play win more cards to close a game. However, Commander is a pretty casual format, so that's not the biggest consideration. Now, Omniscience does see play in Show and Tell variants called Omnitel. You see, while slamming a big threat into play with Show and Tell usually wins you the game, sometimes your opponent will have the answer for your threat. 
and you'll just end up going minus one to not accomplish anything. However, if you use show and tell to cheat an omniscience into play, then you can cast your big threat as well as all of your other interactions and draw spells for free, and now your opponent's one removal won't do anything. The worst case scenario for you is your opponent put in something like Banishing Light into play off of your show and tell, but even in this scenario, you're better off than if you just put your threat directly into play, because you can at least cast all of your draw spells for free, and maybe find an answerer for Banishing Light. Omnitel variants come and go as people sideboard more or less for show and tell decks, but they'll always be at least a little relevant. And at number two, we have Emrakul the Eons Torn. Emrakul is a massive 1515 legendary Eldrazi, with a ridiculous mana cost of 15 mana, and the abilities where it can't be countered, you take an extra turn when you cast it, it can't be the target of colored spells, has flying and annihilator 6, meaning whenever it attacks, the defending player sacrifices 6 permanents. And if it would be put into your graveyard, you shuffle your graveyard into your library. Now, we talked a lot about crazy good threats that show and tell can cheat into play, and Emrakul is the second best creature to cheat into play in the entire game. The combination of being hard to target, hard to block, having an incredibly high power, and literally annihilating your opponent's board means that if you're able to put Emrakul into play, it's very hard to lose that game. Now, Emrakul does have a few downsides. The ability to shuffle your grave into your library makes Emrakul much worse, as it means it can't be reanimated unless you use an instant speed reanimation spell, like Goryeo's Vengeance, to cast in response to its ability going on the stack. Another small downside of Emrakul is that it doesn't generate any card advantage until you declare an attack as an attacker, as it doesn't have an Enter the Battlefield ability or any other impact before attacking. This means that your opponent can use something like Caracas to bounce it to your hand, as it isn't a spell and therefore gets around Emrakul's protection. Now, while these are all real downsides, it doesn't stop Emrakul from being a monster of a card. It's mostly just worth noting these downsides to explain the reason why Emrakul is only the second most powerful creature in Magic, and why number one is. And at number one, we have Grizzlebrand. This is a 7-7 legendary demon with a mana cost of 4 and 4 black, flying, lifelink, and the ability to pay 7 life to let you draw 7 cards. This is one of the strongest abilities in the entire game. Unlike Emrakul, Grizzlebrand immediately gains you a nearly insurmountable amount of card advantage as soon as it comes into play. On top of that, Grizzlebrand is a huge evasive threat that also gives you back your life needed to activate its ability every time it deals damage in combat. There are so many decks that are built entirely around putting Grizzlebrand into play. Grizzlebrand is the best threat in both Reanimator and Show and Tell decks. In modern, people used to cheat Grizzlebrand out with Neoform and Goryeo's Vengeance. Each of these decks had pretty unique engines. The Neoform lists use Allosaurus Rider, a 7 mana creature that you can cast for free by exiling 2 green cards from your hand. Then you sacrifice your Rider to Neoform, which lets you search your deck for a creature whose mana value is equal to 1 plus the sacrificed creature's mana value, which means you can find Grizzlebrand. At that point, the deck would just draw through their whole deck using Nourishing Shoal. An instant lets you gain X life, but you can exile a green card from your hand instead of paying mana for it, which lets X equal the exiled card's mana value to gain a bunch of life, and then play Laboratory Maniac with an empty deck, which will win you the game if you draw a card while your library is empty. On the other hand, the Goryeo's Vengeance decks would put Grizzlebrand into the graveyard with Faceless Looting, return it to the battlefield and give it haste with Goryeo's Vengeance, and then attack their opponents until they die by drawing a ton of cards and taking extra combats with Fury of the Horde, a spell that allows you to take an additional combat, and can be cast for free by exiling two red cards from your hand. Now, both of these decks stopped seeing play after key cards from the strategy were banned in Modern. Despite these decks not being successful more recently, Grizzlebrand is the only card that could have allowed these decks to work. And while Grizzlebrand isn't quite putting in work in Modern, he's still a big part of the legacy metagame. In fact, the main reason Grizzlebrand isn't seen playing Modern is because the best reanimation spell in Modern, Persist, specifically can't target legendary creatures. Specifically because it would be too good with Grizzlebrand if it could. And when other cards are being designed around a card, you know that card is extremely powerful. Alright, and that's the list. Do you think there's any other powerful cards that you don't have to cast that we may have missed, or have ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, let us know down in the comments.